The following podcast is brought to you by the Jonas Podcasting Network, found exclusively at wrestlingwithjonas.com. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Legends Masterclass Series with myself. My name's Jonas, uh, host of the Wrestling with Jonas podcast and the Jonas Podcaster Network. And uh, this is episode three of Legends Masterclass. And uh, today I've got not one, but two fantastic guests with me. And, uh, and I'm going to do the introductions properly here. Uh, weighing 212 pounds from the Royal Forest of Dean, I've got with me none other than exotic Adrian Street and Miss Linda. Uh, thank you so much for joining me on this uh, Legends Masterclass series. How are you both? Oh, we're both, uh, we're both. both fine. Excellent, excellent. Um, and uh, like I say, this is episode three. Previous episodes have included Marty Jones and Tony St. Clair. And today with me, I've got another Legends, not just of the UK wrestling scene, but uh, worldwide, as we will establish throughout the course of this interview. And uh, um, Adrian, I, I want to ask you first of all, and recently we've had the WWE over on our shores in the UK, on your doorstep in Cardiff, no less, uh, for Clash at the Castle in September and all the, the fantastic festivities that happened over the weekend. Uh, and you were featured quite heavily during that weekend with signings and merchandise uh, and being front row um, in the Principality Stadium. Uh, you must have had a, a real fun time in Cardiff that weekend uh, with the biggest wrestling company um, in Cardiff. And uh, like I say, you were featured front and centre. Yeah, um, in, a, in actual fact, whenever they come over, they include us. Um, the last wrestling I did actually was the um, the NXT UK. Um, yeah. That Linda and I went to Newton Abbey. Yeah, yeah. The the place in Newton Abbey. They don't do anything by halves. I tell you what, everything they did was fantastic. Yeah. John, uh, John Moss was there. Um, Johnny Saint. Yeah. Um, Steve Regal. They were all, they were all at um, at uh, Newton Abbey, and uh, we were teaching the uh, the new NXT wrestlers, like the superstars of the. Uh, yeah. So I mean that ex that's actually extended my. Um, my wrestling career by uh, a number of years, 60, 60 has. 61 years as a pro. Absolutely fantastic. And uh, I was aware that you were at their performance centre. Um, I'm not sure exactly when it was, but you were there with the NXT UK superstars and all the fantastic coaches there, many of whom you know very well from your years in the business. Um, and that must have been a great thrill for them. And uh, like I say, a great thrill for you as well to uh, share some of your knowledge and your experience with uh, some of the, the talent on the UK scene at the moment, Adrian. Yeah, they actually made um, they actually made a documentary on me at the time. It, you can still sort of find it on uh, you know various places on the internet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I've seen that documentary a couple of times in preparation for this, um, but. Um, so you're a very proud Welshman, a very proud uh, South Wales uh, boy. Um, but uh, you, you, you're born in uh, 1940. Is that right, Adrian? Yeah. Yeah, I'll be, uh, I'll be 82 next month. Congratulations. Congratulations. Taking you back to when you were uh, younger, um, what sort of wrestling was around at the time? What sort of exposure did you have to pro wrestling growing up as a lad? How did you find out about wrestling when you were younger? Well, I was into bodybuilding. And there was a friend of mine um, named Peter Inge. He was into wrestling. I, I, I remember I was sort of trying to sort of I'd be telling about all the uh, top bodybuilders, Reg Park, Bill Pearl, 
you know, all those that are top bodybuilders and everything like that, Spencer Churchill. And um, he'd be telling me about uh, like various professional wrestlers. And there's a town like close to, uh, to where I lived, where I used to buy my bodybuilding magazines um, and what have you. Anyway, I was in there one day and um, I bought like a couple of latest physique magazines. Funnily enough, I was on the front cover of the same magazines a number of years later. Brilliant. Yeah. But anyway, um, I noticed a couple of uh, American boxing and wrestling magazines and everything like that. And I thought, oh, I'll get those for Peter. And it's funny because my mother used to say to me, like, okay, you're lifting weights, you, you know, you're getting big muscles. What are you going to do with your muscles when you get them? And at the time, I'd say, well, when I get them, I'll look after them. But anyway, on the way back, on the bus ride back to uh, the town I lived in, I sort of looked through these uh, wrestling magazines that I'd bought from my friend Peter. I was hooked. That was it. I knew what I was going to do with the rest of my life. So when my mother said to me, like, next time, you know, okay, what are you going to do with your muscles when you get them? I said, I'm going to be the best professional wrestler that I can possibly be. And I was. Yeah, yeah. And when you were going through the pages of those wrestling magazines, Adrian, what was it that was captivating you? What really kind of pulled you in and uh, made you fall in love with the support? Just just, just going through the magazines, what was it exactly that, uh, that drew you in as a fan? Um, it was a flamboyance. You know, I mean, I've, I've always been very interested in history and I think gladiators and all that sort of uh, thing. I mean, wow, you know, and I've always liked picturesque warriors, Red Indians, um, Zulus, you know, various uh, various tribes like Javaro Indians and the, and the Dayaks in Borneo and all that sort of uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. And the idea of dressing up and doing combat, you know, like the uh, ancient Roman gladiators, that's something that always appealed to me. And yeah. especially the American wrestlers, uh, people like um, Nature Boy, Buddy Rogers, Don Lear Jonathan, all those sort of people. They, you know, they made a spectacle of the battle and everything like that. And I was hooked. That was it. I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, and I did it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I think it's been well documented, but your your, your father was a, a coal miner, a pit miner in South Wales. And you, you yeah. was a, a coal miner or a pit miner with him very briefly uh, around the age of 14, 15, but you, you've discovered that it, it wasn't for you. Um, I really didn't get on with my father. My father, and, my father and I hated each other. And he always threatened me when I was in school and everything like that. Oh, you know, you wait until you get out of school. I'll have you down a coal mine with me. And I said, I'm not going down a coal mine. It's dark down there and I was made to be seen. But anyway... Um, I didn't like school either, so I, 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 you know, I wanted to get out of uh, school, and there was nothing else going. So my father had his way. I was working, ended up working down the coal mine when I was fifteen. And um, anyway, I didn't like it. I, I, I always said I was going to be a pro wrestler, and my father and um, any other coal, you can't be a professional wrestler have you seen the size of those guys little little guy like you like they chew you up and sort of spit you out you know you can't do it but the thing is if i say i want to do something and somebody tells me i can't it makes me more determined i didn't like my father at all and he didn't like me but he was a great influence on me succeeding in the, in the business because I would have died 
before I sort of uh, failed and proved him to be right. Yeah. No way he was going to be right. And how did you make your first steps in the business then? Because you left home at 16, I understand. And uh, I, I believe you went to London or you certainly left South Wales. What were the first few steps like? How did you get into the business? How did you find out about training schools or promotions? Tell us about that journey. Well, I used to go to, um, I used to, go to Cardiff and watch the uh, professional wrestling there. And... I really liked the wrestling, but, you know, they weren't as flamboyant as what I was used to. I was disappointed with uh, the way they dressed. You know, they'd have sort of drab dressing gowns. They'd have, like, short little wrestling boots, not like sort of high boots like the, like the uh, Americans uh, used to wear. And, I mean, they'd go to... They'd go to the ring, like, wearing dressing gowns, like an old guy who would sort of where well, like when he was sitting down with his uh, puffing on his pipe you know it, it i was really disappointed with the way they dressed yeah and the way they presented themselves um so when i first started wrestling i mean one of my one of my main idols was a guy called don leo jonathan um, I, I'd been boxing on a fairground booth. I was boxing anywhere between four and seven times in one day and getting one pound for each fight, unless it was like a six-rounder. And if it was a six-rounder, I'd get three pounds. I was, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a good... Um, I can't say I'm a good boxer. I can fight. In those days, I could fight better than I could wrestle. But um, anyway, I was in the YMCA and um, a guy called Chick, Chick Pervy, no, Chick Osmond, um, he started teaching me pro wrestling. I was already going to various clubs and wrestling amateur style. But anyway, he started teaching me uh, pro, pro wrestling. And one day he said to me, I, I used to go to Dale Martins and Dale Martins told me the same thing. They were like the main promoters in, uh, in the UK. They told me the same thing. They said, you're too small and you're too young. You know, you, you, you can't really be a wrestler or anything like that. So I'd keep on going back. I'm saying, well, I've put a couple of pounds on. <laughs> and I'm three weeks older than I was last time I was in there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, they just kept showing me the door. They wouldn't have it. But anyway, um, Chick, Chick Osman said to me one day, we were, I was practicing uh, with him. He said, listen, he said, I've just got a chance to wrestle for um, uh, Dale Martins. He said, they won't let me wrestle for any other promotions. I said, I didn't know there was any other. He said, yeah. He said, would you do me a favor? He said, I've been teaching you to wrestle um, professionally. He said, would you do me a favor? He said, I don't want to burn any bridges for these smaller promoters that he's wrestling for. He said, but Dale Martins won't let me wrestle for him. You know, wrestle for anybody else. He said, I don't want to burn my bridges with them. Would you go along and ask them, tell them if you want to take my place? He said, I'll give them, I'll call them up and tell them to expect you. Anyway, um, I went to a place called the Addington Hotel, which is outside of London. And uh, I walked into the dressing room there, introduced myself. And... Um, when I was on the fair, I'll have to backpedal a little bit now because this is something I should have added. When I was bo when I was boxing on a box on the um, boxing booth, the marker there said to me, "What's your name?" And I said, uh, "Oh, he said, what's your name, kid?" 
and I saw the John Lee Jonathan. I said, oh, uh, Jonathan. He said, Jonathan what? I said, Kid Jonathan. He said, oh, okay. And it was then that I thought, I thought to myself, it's a good wrestling name. And that's the name that I used to use when I had photographs taken in the, in the uh, Physique magazine. Anyway, when I went in to see this uh, Johnny Charles, who was a promoter in, uh, in the Addington Hotel, he said, okay, he said, uh, he said, I'll use you on the next card. He said, what is your name? I said, um, Kit Jonathan. He said, you look like Tarzan. He said, I'll call you Tarzan, Jonathan. I said, okay, Kid Tarzan. No, he said, I'll call you Kid Tarzan. I said, Kid Tarzan, Jonathan. And that was it. For the first four years of my career, I actually wrestled as Kid Tarzan, Jonathan. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. Hmm? Yep, yep, please yeah. carry on. And like I wanted, to, I wanted to try to make the name famous if I could. So whenever I start posing for uh, the same wrestling, uh, the same bodybuilding magazines that I used to buy, I was on front cover. The first time I was in one, I was on front cover. Um, and I was like one of their favorite uh, cover boys. I had photographs taken on loads and loads of, just about every bodybuilding magazine that was out at the time I had my photograph taken in the more on on the front cover. Yeah. Anyway, eventually the reason I liked out with the big promoters wasn't because all of a sudden I was a great professional wrestler or anything like that. It's the fact that they they got TV. And all of a sudden it exploded. They were running about 700 wrestling shows. It was joint promotions. Dale Martin is just a part of like joint promotions, big promoted promotions. It was all over, uh, all over Britain. But anyway, joint promotions used to run something like 700 promotions, wrestling shows all over Britain in one year. When they got TV expo exposure, it actually went from 700 shows a year to 4,000, over 4,000 shows all over Britain in one year. And I got my break, not because I was like, all of a sudden I was a great wrestler, all of a sudden I got big. It was because they needed somebody. They were really short of wrestlers. So they needed somebody who knew how to lace up a pair of boots to get in the <laughs> moral land. Yeah. And that's how I got my brain. And right from the off, I, I started wrestling. My first pro match for Dale Martins was a main event match. Not because I was a main event. I was a preliminary for a long time but because I was on with Jackie Palo and I was in Weymouth, first time, first pro match I had for him. By the time I started wrestling for Dale Martins, um, I was 20. Oh, right. Hmm. From, from the time I was 16 until I was 20, yeah. um, I, I wrestled uh, for the independents. Yeah. And I know that uh, you mentioned that you were uh, Kid, Tars and Jonathan for the first four years of your career, Adrian. Um, yeah. And then you were inspired by another one of your American wrestling heroes, Nature Boy Buddy Rogers. And you, you kind of took on the Nature Boy moniker or the Nature Boy uh, persona gimmick um, in honor of Buddy Rogers, didn't you? Uh, four or five years into your career. So you changed your, your gimmick um, at the age of 20 or four years into your professional career, didn't you? Well, the thing is, um, the only time that I would be main event or semi main event is if I was wrestling with, if I was an opponent, more or less, for one of the stars. 
Mm. Um, if I was wrestling somebody else, it was like basically my own status. All I'd be is a pre preliminary wrestler. And I didn't get into pre professional wrestling to be a preliminary. I got in there because I wanted to be a star, and not only that, um, I wanted to prove my father and the other coal miners that generally took the piss um, just to prove them wrong. Yeah. And um, I thought of myself, Nature Boy Buddy Rogers, he had the look. And I thought to myself, that is something I want to look. I've got I've got I've got to I've got to create an image of myself and everything like that. Anyway, I decided that if I wanted to be oh, this is what happened actually that sort of uh, stirred me in that direction. Whenever the wrestlers used to go to the various venues, on the way they'd stop at like a greasy spoon restaurants or sort of greasy spoon sort of Cat places to eat. Yeah. On there, like on the way there, I wouldn't eat that stuff. I've always been very conscious of what I ate. So I take with me. Um, maybe some baked chicken, a load of fruit, a couple of pints of milk. <laughs> and whenever they stopped at those greasy spoons, I'd get out of the car, I'd know which way we were going, you know, to the show. So I'd, I'd jog and walk along the uh, road and I used to get a kick out of, they picked me up you know, when they said finished eating and got back in the car. They picked me up on the way and I got a kick out of them saying, yeah, somebody give you a lift. You never ever walked, you never walked this far, you know? And of course I used to spur me on because like, I mean, I felt as a compliment. They wouldn't believe that I'd got that far. Yeah. But anyway, it got back to the, uh, there was, there was um, a guy that used to write um for the uh for the promotions magazines and and um and their programs and uh what have you and he got to hear about that his name was charles masco he'd actually been a wrestler himself many years before but he was working in the office and he used to he used to sort of write articles in the uh in their programs and in their magazines and he, as a result of the way that I trained, he actually dubbed me as um, Nature Boy, Nature Boy Adrian Street. Fantastic. And um, um, please continue. I thought to myself, I've got to live up to that name. How do I do it? He's got the look I want to look. So I went out and, and uh, bought some really pale blue uh, velvet um, and uh, silver lame for the, uh, for the lining, big puffy sleeves. I trunked the match and I went to Lonsdale's in, um, in um, Peak Street in, uh, in London and asked them to make me some boots. And I said, I want something different. I don't want black. They said, oh, strangely enough, they said somebody came in and ordered a pair of boots. They had left a deposit, but they didn't pay for them. And they'd been there for ages. A pair of powder blue boots. And I bought the velvet and material to make the trunks out of to match. And that's the way it looked. And I thought, so what else do I need to do? I bleached my hair blonde, the same as uh, Nature Boy Buddy Rogers. And that was a look I, I gave. Now, when I walked into the, when I got into the dressing room with the blonde hair, 
I mean, all of us, the other wrestlers in the um, in the dressing room, what have you done with your hair like, you know? Then I couldn't wait to put the stuff on to sort of, um, like, you know, what about this powder blue boots, powder blue um, uh, trunks, and this lovely silver jacket, a uh, lovely powder blue jacket with the silver lava. You're not going in a ring looking like that, are you? And they turned into the coal miners, honestly. <laughs> wrestlers wrestlers could be bitches a lot of them you know yeah yeah, yeah. oh you know you know going in the ring like i mean you. anyway i said yeah another one i said well wait until people get a load of me you know okay like you know i know what the wrestlers are like they you know they they get jealous they get bitchy and all the rest of it so i went striding out they expect the people to go like oh what are we looking at last week I walk up from the people was like, Whoa, Mary, oh, isn't she cute? Give us a kiss. But I've always had an answer for everybody, you know. Like, who'd want to kiss you, fat? So, you know, you're too effeminate for me. You, you're too, um, you know, too butch for me. I like my, I like my, no, you're too effeminate for me. I like my men more manly, you know. <laughs> anyway, I thought, I'm on my way to the ring. Um, I see the um, my opponent looking and sort of staring at me and everything like that. I got in the ring, uh, took my gown off and everything like that, and he starts sort of um, blowing kisses over to me and everything like that, and give me a limp hand rest. He turned round to face the uh, thing as the bell went. I rushed over, touched him up the backside. He jumped about four foot in the air and as he turned around and planted a kiss on his chop. <laughs> I mean, that was just to get back at him. But I mean, the reaction I got from that, I mean, it lifted the roof. Now, right. all the way through, I'm pissed off with the people and I'm throwing it back in their face. So I'm carrying on, you know, like a bit sort of puffy and everything like that. Um, I, I knew how to do that from a lot of the uh, ph physique photographers who were gay. I mean, the way they'd sort of skip about and everything like that. So, I mean, basically, I knew what I knew what to do as far as that was concerned. So I did that in between beating the shit out of uh, my opponent. Yeah. But it was like a contrast. Now. I was bad. I was hurt by the. Um, I was hurt by the reception I got from the uh, from the crowd because I didn't expect that. I knew when I go back in go back in the dressing room that the wrestlers were going to be on my right on my case. They were right. But the thing is, I thought I'm going to turn this around. So I mean, can you imagine? Say so walk into a party and everything like that. There's a party going on, and you go in there like to sort of make yourself sort of. But you step, you step on a banana skin or something like that. You fall off over head and land in a sherry trifle. And yeah. You get up, one up, and rings in your eyes and everything like that. And everybody in the place laughs at you. Then you laugh with them and everything like that. Yeah, I meant to do that. Like, wasn't it funny? Like, you know, shall I do it again? So that's the way I walk back in the dressing room, like, you know, what about that? And I thought to myself, okay, that wasn't a reaction I was looking at, but I got more reaction than anybody else got. But you've got a reaction, exactly, yeah. So I said to myself, shit, I'm onto something. Wasn't a reaction I was looking for, and I was disappointed with it. But if that's what it's going to take, so I evolved from that. Yeah. Um, let, let, let me ask you, um, Adrian. Um, Royal Albert Hall. I know in nineteen, I think sixty three, and then again in nineteen sixty six, you had some opportunities to wrestle in the Royal Albert Hall, didn't you? 
Um, yeah. Tell us about that because I know that you, it may have only been two or three occasions that you had a chance to wrestle in that historic venue, um, th that historic wrestling venue, let alone anything else. Like I say, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, shown off so many fantastic wrestling shows over the years and wonderful wrestling matches. What, what was it like um, performing at the Royal Albert Hall during that time? Well, not only did I wrestle at the Royal Albert Hall, which, like you said, I mean, that was a big thrill for me. Yeah. But I've actually wrestled main event. Bobby Bonds and myself, I were with the Hells Angels, wrestled against the, um, a Red Indian team there. We also wrestled against... Um, a couple of French wrestlers main event there on a, on a, on a number of occasions. Whenever whenever um, what was the thing? There was us against Europe. I mean, it was like way before uh, Brexit or anything like that. But they they did a big thing of. Um, uh, UK wrestlers against the uh, European wrestlers. And um, I remember, <laughs> I remember having a tooth removed out of my elbow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I hit my opponent in the mouth so hard. <laughs> uh, I ended up with some teeth. And I fell down on the, I fell down on the floor with him. And I mean, people really hated me by then. And I said, well, I know I'll get some, uh, I put my hand up there like that and brushed the blood off my elbow all over my, all over my uh, head. And when I got up, he was pumping blood and I had blood, I had his blood all over my head which the people thought was mine, really excited them. And on the way back to the dressing room, a doctor jumped up and he said, I'm a doctor, I'm a doctor. I said, ha. I said, I think I need a dentist. <laughs> I said, there's two things like trying to look in my mouth. When he got back to the, uh, when he followed me back to the dressing room and I said, that there was actually an L, I, Actually, a tooth or a piece of a tooth stuck in my elbow. I've still got, I've still got the scar there, actually. Yeah, and uh, tell us a bit more about your your tag team with Bobby Barnes because you were quite a notable heel tag team, weren't you? As as the Hell's Angels, um, and had some wonderful yeah. matches. Um, and uh, let's say you had a let's say a good time and a good run with Bobby as the Hell's Angels. Yeah, do you know the funny thing is. Carry on, please, yeah. I didn't even know anything about the motorbike gangs called the Hell's Angels. Didn't know anything about them at all. This is way before I'd ever heard of them. We yeah. were one, I wanted to think of a name rather than just exotic, uh, rather than, I uh, wasn't exotic, rather than Adrian Street and Bobby Barnes. Um, I wanted to think of, a, of an actual name. There was a Black Diamonds, there was a Royal Brothers. Um, before I was wrestling, with, before I had a tag team partner, um, before Bobby Barnes, my first regular tag team partner was uh, Tony Charles. And, the Welsh uh, Wizards. We were the Welsh Wizards, yeah. yeah. But I was still, I was, I was wrestling sometimes with Bobby Barnes as a partner um, before um, at the same time, you know, some, sometimes sometimes he'd be my partner and I'd wrestle as a bad guy. Then another night I'd be wrestling as Tony Charles with the, with, as a tag partner and um, we were wrestling as good guys. But anyway, I found I really like, I really got more reaction from the crowd when I was a bad guy. I didn't start to envelop in that. 
And I thought to myself, well, as much as I love Tony, Tony Charles and what have you, learned a lot as well as his, as his tag team partner. But I decided that I, I want to go where the reaction is. Anyway, it was Adrian Street and, and um, Bad Boy Bobby Barnes. And I thought to myself, well, as we were the Welsh Wizards before, there's the Royal Brothers, there's the Black Diamonds, there's the Cadmans and, and uh, what have you. Various ones had that. Uh, I'd like a title, and I wanted to think of something like that. I knew nothing about the motorbike gangs at all. It didn't come from that. We were walking around Sheffield. We got there. Re we got to Sheffield really early, and we were walking around for something to do. And we went to see a movie. Um, Oh, George Peppard, what was the name of that movie? Oh dear. About airplanes. The Blue Max. Right. We we went in went to see a movie called The Blue Max. And Bob said like, oh, he said, like, um, why don't they make more movies like that? It's like, you know, that was really good. I said they did make one uh, many years ago. Black and white movie. Um I said, it's called Hell's Angels. And it was an old black and white movie about the biplanes and everything like that. Like, like the Baron Ron, Baron Ron uh, Reichhofen, you know, with the, uh, with the red, with the red triplane and all that kind of stuff. It is about that. <clears throat> I said, yeah, it's called Hell. I said, damn, I said, what, what a good, I said, what a good um, name that would be for us, the Hell's Angels. Yeah, fantastic. But the name. thing is, I had a different idea altogether. I got some, I got some costumes made that were like white, almost like, almost like a choir boy's cape. I had an Aeon man with a halo over the top. And Bob, I'd like be on his with a hair over the top. Now, we'd wear bright red boots and bright red trunks, but you could you could only see the um, you could only see the uh, the only red that showed when we went on our way to the ring, we'd walk down almost like choir boys to the ring. When we go in and they announce this, we throw the things open and red trunks, red inside. I put red, I put big red sequins on the inside as well, so they'd sort of flash. And it was nothing to do with motorbike guns or anything like that. Like I said, we didn't even know about them at the time. Absolutely fantastic. And uh, let, let me ask, you've obviously got Miss Linda next to you there. Uh, let me change the uh, the orientation of the screen. Hi, Miss Linda. Lovely to see you. Uh, how did how did the two of you first meet? How did how did how was you first made aware of Miss Linda or Miss Linda? How did you first come across Adrian? Uh, tell us that story. I, I, came, I came across him because I, I, I was working in an aquarium shop in uh, in Croydon, I think it was then. And um, I was selling marine tropical fish. It was one of the first, first um, marine tropical fish store in um, in London. And it was all expensive. You know, those lovely tropical um, marine fish or bright and cold things and everything. And um, he happened to um, to see, he went, he went to the Ideal Homes exhibition. I don't know whether... The ideal home exhibition is ever on now. Maybe it doesn't exist anymore. But I think anyway, it is. Yeah, I've there. heard of it. Yeah, anyway, Earl's, Earl's Court, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, anyway, yeah. He 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 went there, and they we had a setup um, there, 
uh, I didn't go actually, but um, the actual owner did with the with all the creations, a lovely town hall set up and everything. And um, Adrian had to see um, to see it, and he, he really liked the fish and everything. And um, he said, "Oh, he, he said, um, oh, I'll, I'll have to come into the uh, shop and have a look at the fish and see see if I can get a tank set up and everything." So anyway, he did, and I was working there, and I saw him, and I wasn't. Uh, anything of a wrestling fan actually um i thought he looked a bit um a bit odd when he came in the uh, into the shop because um you know with his blonde hair and stuff like that you know i did look a bit different and he kept giving me the eye <laughs> <laughs> and, and we got we, we got talking and um I showed him a lot of fish and stuff, and then he sort of went up, went up into the office and sort of um, placed an order for uh, for a tank and all that stuff. So I think the setup, and um, he kept coming back. So I she think kept on telling me the sick <laughs> ones they'd die, and I have to go back and get more. That's how she trapped me. <laughs> yeah. There we go. So, so so that's how I met him, and. Um, then we, we eventually went out and, um, well, it just The rest went. is history. Yeah, that's right, yeah. There we go. And, and uh, you, you did a bit of wrestling yourself, I understand, Miss Linda, as, as a, a Blackfoot Sioux in the in the yeah. 70s. Is that right? Yeah. And um, it came about because Adrian was in partnership with, um, with a promoter in um, in. Oh, Williams. Williams in Wales, and um, they used to have the girl wrestling. Love it. I, I didn't wrestle at, right at that time. I'd, I'd just be part of the audience or sort of backstage and stuff like that. And sometimes the girls were they, they turn up sometimes if they felt like it. They turn up, <laughs> or they wouldn't turn up. You know, and they they then they get missing a girl, so it was difficult. You know. Having having um, having an odd girl there, so they thought they thought it was a good idea if I learned to uh, do a few moves and stuff, and um, so I could fill in, you know, if somebody didn't tur turn up, and that's what happened. I sort of that's how I got into wrestling. Absolutely, <laughs> and we're good. We're going to talk more about some of your matches when you got over to the States a bit later on, because I know that you were involved in several matches alongside Adrian. But um, uh, it, uh, please continue. Did you have something to say, Adrian? Oh, oh yeah. Do you know my, my first first professional wrestling match was in um, a town in Wales called Blynafestiniog, and it was with um, this girl. Um, was it? What was her name now? Phil Martell. Phil Martell, yeah, sorry. I was forgetting well I don't know. Yeah, and she was a real real rough type. I mean, it was it was really scary. And <laughs> <laughs> but I survived I, but I survived it and uh, went on to do some more matches with her. And yeah. um, well she was quite um, she was a real tough sort. Yeah. And, I got beaten up a little bit every, every time I went in there, <laughs> but I, I survived it. And then but eventually um, I started working with other girls and, and, and until we um, until we left um, left England. Absolutely. Um, let, let me ask you, Adrian, uh, and maybe Miss Linda, but when did you first adopt the exotic uh, part of your character? When did that flamboyance start kind of manifested itself into the character we became familiar with when did that first start happening well, well i mean um i adopted that image more and more um while i was still in this country yeah you know first of all it was like i'd wear like a little bit of makeup and everything like that so people when i walk past the people they go is he wearing makeup? They weren't sure if I was or if I wasn't. But anyway, I just kept pushing the envelope, pushing the envelope, making the the makeup I was wearing uh, more exotic. Um, I started tying bows in my hair, putting feathers in my hair, 
two reasons for that. One was, like I told you before, I was always interested in ancient warriors and, and colorful warriors. And they would make themselves a fair bigger, like wearing epaulets and, and, and uh, uniforms. They'd wear busbies to make them look taller or feathered headdresses, like Red Indian Zulus and stuff like that. They'd actually make themselves look an awful lot bigger than they did. I mean, the ancient Greek hoplites and whatever, yeah, I mean, they, they'd have a, a crest that's about three feet tall on top of their uh, heads. You know, I mean, if a warrior's fighting, they turn around and they see that in front of them. Yeah. They don't sort of stop and think it's all like, well, well, half of him is hot. <laughs> you know, it's like, whoa. So that's the reason I did that. But anyway, with the exact stuff and everything like that. Anyway, I... Leonaris was actually a very good writer, actor, as well as a professional wrestler. And he wrote, he wrote a, um, a script for BBC Two called A Drink Out of the Bottle. And it's about professional wrestling. And they wanted a character like mine in it. He actually wrote, I mean, he actually based one of the characters on me. But the thing is, it turned out good for me because nobody else could do me. Nobody else could wrestle the way I wrestled. And there wasn't anybody else doing that thing. So I was in the movie and played a character called Lucky Day who was actually based on me. And they wanted that character to be even more exaggerated. So I never wore lipstick or anything like that. You know, to me, that was too puffy. I never wore lipstick until I was in that movie. Yeah. yeah. And like the makeup got even more wild, you know, even, like even more wild than it was be like before. They wanted exaggerated me. Yeah. But the thing is, after Please people, <clears throat> a lot of people saw the movie. In actual fact, Diana Dawes called me. Diana Dawes is a good friend of ours. She called me. As soon as we we actually watched it on TV. As soon as it finished, the phone rang to Diana. And um, oh, I mean, she really gave me some compliments. She said, "Your face." She said, "When you got angry." She said, I've never seen that intensity. It's like, it was really, I'd love to get hold of it because I only ever, I only ever saw it that one time. I've never seen it since. It's got to be out there somewhere. I'm sure it's available on YouTube, but uh, I'm sure for anybody watching this, if you have that footage, send it to Adrian Street. Oh, but, uh, please. Absolutely. There's, there's got to be some footage out there.